um, I'm going to party straight over to Colin. I think you've prepared um, a short talk. Um, you can talk about it. it's going to be um, a preview of his book that is not published. So you're going to tantalise us with it so that we all want to go and read it. So don't give us everything. Just give us the summary um, at, at the overview. That would be great, Colin. So I'll hand you over to Colin. Right. Thank you for asking me and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm, I'm told I've got about 15 minutes. Is that right? Followed by chat. Good. OK. Yeah. Yeah. This talk that I want to give really takes about a day and uh, <laughs> it's the basis of a, of a course we're working on which takes about a year and I've given it twice over a period of a week and everybody said it was much too cramped and crowded so tonight will very much be a summary of, of what I want to say. Two things I think outstanding, the first is that there is nothing in this world more important than the food and farming. It's absolutely at the centre of everything we do. It affects everything else we do. It's affected by everything else we do. So you would think that a government that was actually serious, as one assumes the British government is supposed to be, would take agriculture very, very seriously indeed. In fact, put it right at the centre of its thinking. And it doesn't. I mean, to the last... For the last, I've been interested and involved in farming for roughly, well, the same sort of length as um, Don, actually, about 45 years, maybe a bit more. And um, it's, it struck me at that time that, that to, to British governments of all persuasions, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of also ran. It's, it's a marginal thing. And that's reflected in the quality of the secretaries of state, who are either people basically on the way out who are being kicked sideways or their people on the way up, like David Miliband, or their sort of marketing time, like Michael, Go um, is it Michael Gove? Well, I think it is. None of whom really have any grasp of what's going on or, or why it matters. And re recently, of course, the last 40 years, actually, ever since Margaret Thatcher, the whole attempt has been not to create agriculture that is really good for humanity and good for the biosphere, which is what one would think agriculture is all about, but it's been, as it were, rammed into the round hole, the square peg of agriculture, into the round hole of neoliberal economics. And it's been regarded, as the expression has it, has it as a business like any other, which is an expression I first heard in the 1970s, and business under the neoliberal ideology has been effectively redefined not as a sort of natural underpinning of a mixed, mixed economy as a democratic society, but as uh, simply as another way of making money. And as a way of making money and of concentrating wealth, it's as well as a way of making money, it's not as good as say hairdressing, which you know, costs much more cost effective. And it's not as, uh, although it does concentrate wealth very, very well, which is the other thing that neoliberalism is all about. So what I'm suggesting, but there's two things. First of all, we need to rethink agriculture absolutely from first principles. But secondly, nothing can be put to right ad, ad hoc. So everything has to be rethought. If we rethink agriculture, then we've got a fair chance of getting everything else right in society and in the world as well. But unless we rethink everything else in the world as well, then we can never get agriculture right. They're absolutely integrated. And this whole idea, if can David put up my slide, because it's all summarized in my slide, which I'm hoping will appear on your screens. There we are, hooray. Jolly good, I think this is wonderful, this technology. Anyway, look, the point is, this is, as I say, is a summary of everything that we need to think about and the way we need to think about it. You would observe that there are 12 balloons. These ellipses I call balloons for want of a better word. And they're arranged in four tiers. And the top tier is called the goal. And it strikes me that governments in general, certainly governments like ours or governments like Trump's, if it can be called that, um, 
really, really define what it is they're trying to achieve. I mean, Trump talks about uh, what make America great again. What on earth is that supposed to mean? Um, the Brits, I can't remember what were they talking about, take control again, all, all that stuff. Both of them, in fact, are, are, are entirely neoliberal. Both of them are basically, therefore, more or less run by the corporates and the financiers. And both of them, therefore, uh, well, that's basically it. What I'm suggesting is that if we're going to have government at all, and that's another interesting question, do we need government at all? The answer is probably yes. But if we're going to have government at all, then we have to start by absolutely defining what it is we're trying to achieve. And I'm suggesting that what we should be trying to achieve is convivial societies within a flourishing biosphere. And I would put in a plea, which I always do, that we should banish the word environment, at least in this context. Environment simply means surroundings, and surroundings in the modern neoliberal world means um, real estate. So you can get more money for your house if it's uh, in a nice place. But, uh, but the biosphere means the living world, and it's the living world we should be trying to, 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 to uh, f um, encourage, it's nurture. Within the con word convivial or the idea of the convivial society improves, includes, as far as I'm concerned, the idea of personal fulfillment. I don't think you can have a convivial society unless people are, uh, are themselves fulfilled personally. And the ideal, of course, is to have people who achieve fulfillment by serving society. That to me, incidentally, is what socialism means. But we'll pass on from that. That's the goal. Convivial society in a flourishing biosphere with personal fulfillment. Then we come on to action. Now, what do we actually have to do in order to achieve the, the goal? Well, everything we do actually contributes to this end or detracts from this end. So what one should have under action, excuse me, is absolutely everything that we do. But I'm focusing on technologies and I'm suggesting that in general, we need this thing that uh, Schumacher called appropriate technology. And appropriate technology is technology that is actually geared to defined ends, which should be defined social ends and should also be defined ecological ends. Whereas, as it now, as things now stand, of course, ecology, like anything, everything else, uh, sorry, technology, like everything else, is driven by the perceived need to maximize profit. So what we actually do in this world is determined really by what is the most profitable thing. Now, within all the many technologies that we've got to attend to, there are two which I think are outstanding. One is agriculture and the other is food culture, which of course is the sort of twin of enlightened agriculture. Now, enlightened agriculture is what I'm going to be talking about when I stop talking, when I stop doing this general stuff. So I'll say no more about it, but it's the thing we absolutely have to get right. And food culture is the complement to enlightened agriculture. You cannot have agriculture that really works unless you have a corresponding food culture, which means that you have people who actually appreciate what enlightened farmers do and enable them to do it. The third thing we need propping up all these things, the third tier are called infrastructure. And the infrastructure is basically the organization of the society. And I'm suggesting that we need democratic government and we need an economic, what I'm calling economic democracy. Other people have also used the term, but more specifically, green economic democracy. In other words, we've got to rethink the economy. And thirdly, of course, the third component of the infrastructure is law and the laws that really count in this context and in the, in the world as a whole are the laws that relate to land ownership and so on. And one of the things we absolutely need beyond any question across in all countries, and I'm always inclined to say particularly in Britain, is land reform. Because at the moment, as I'm sure you all know, something like 5,000 families, which is something like one ten thousandth of the 
population own half of British farmland. And I think we're told that 1% of the population own as much as 50% of the rest and so on and so on and so on. We absolutely have to get laws of land ownership, etc. right, which we're miles from doing. And the final thing which underpins everything is what I'm calling mindset. And to me, which is the sum total of all the ideas and all the attitudes that we take more or less take for granted, but which really determine how we go about handling all the rest, all the practicalities of life. And I've divided it into four, morality and science, morality telling us what we um, ought to do in life, science telling us what we can do in life, how the world actually works. And both of these things essentially are rooted in metaphysics. And metaphysics, unfortunately, has gone missing, which is, a, which is one of the things that seriously undermines the modern, the modern world. Metaphysics is, of course, at the core of all religions, but then it gets mixed up with theology, which complicates it no end. But I'm very keen that we should reintroduce metaphysics at the centre of all serious thinking. And all these things, of course, are affected by the arts, which are the jokers in the pack and affect our attitudes to life. Excuse me. <coughs> now, the point is not only do we have to rethink all these things, but we have to rethink all of them in the light of everything else. And that's what these lines are meant to indicate, that everything, all the balloons, each, each balloon is connected to all the others. And I think if you study the lines, not that I have really, that they show that this is, this is, these are all the interactions that you need. So what we're looking at here is what I would call a holistic education, where everything is seen in the light of everything else. If you merely study each individual thing, you get a kind of kaleidoscopic view of the world. But to get a holistic, integrated view of the world, you need to study all the different things together. Now, all this lot, believe it or not, is summarised in my latest book. And I'll just show you what it's called. Can you see it's called The Great Rethink? And uh, this is not, of course, the book. This is just a printout of the, of the text. But the book should be out in a couple of months. Incidentally, this is by, certainly just by the way, in about 1605, Francis Bacon wrote a book called The Great Instauration, in which he says we have to think everything again from first principles. And in fact, instauration really means rethink. And I didn't know that when I started on my book, but I know it now. And I'm very pleased to find that good old Francis beat me to it by about 400 years. Anyway, the thing I really want to talk about is enlightened agriculture. Now, enlightened agriculture is defined very simply and very roughly, but it's good enough. Actually, David, I think we can get this off the screen now, if you like. Thank you. Enlightened agriculture is defined very simply as, well, I've got it somewhere, but anyway, I know the, I know it, as agriculture that is expressly designed to provide everybody in the world with good food forever. Um, forever is a very long time. I really mean for as long as the planet lasts. But I think instead of thinking in terms of getting through the next century, which is what people are thinking about at the moment because it's a bit touch and go with global warming and all the rest, I think we should be thinking for starters about the next million years. And there's absolutely no reason why the human race shouldn't do pretty well over the next million years, why our descendants in a million years' time should not be feeling better about themselves and more secure than we do now. And there's no reason, no good reason, there's plenty of reasons, but there's no good reason why our fellow creatures shouldn't survive and do well alongside us. And that should be the ambition. And agriculture is right at the heart. And the kind of agriculture that we need is what I'm calling enlightened agriculture. Now, first sort of question is, what do we want agriculture to do? And I think, well, not just me, everybody. Agriculture, we need to do, to have three different qualities. The first is it needs to be productive. 
The second is that it needs to be sustainable. And the third is that it needs to be resilient. Now, productive. We have been told over the last 20, 30, 40 years that in order to feed the rising population and raising, rising standards and all that stuff, we need to produce 50% more food by 2050. I believe the FAO said this in the early 20th century and the British government repeated it in a big report in 2011. That's become the mantra, 50% more by um, 2050. And I've heard politicians say, this isn't enough. We've actually got to double output by the end of the century, 2100. And it is further, we are further given to understand that the only way we can achieve this enormous increase in output is with high tech. And this is the justification for GMOs and uh, all, all the other stuff that goes with it, cloning and super, super fertilizers and so on and so on. And so we're told we need very productive agriculture, which is high tech, and that's what we've got to go for. And anybody who says differently is an idiot or a peasant or something derogatory. I don't think the word peasant is derogatory, incidentally, but, but as it were, the powers that be do. Anyway. This, both of these wings of this argument are completely untrue. And one of the things that struck me over the last 20, 30 years is that a lot of what emanates from on high is simply not the case. And it's not the case partly because we are being lied to for convenience, but also because the people in charge, like the various secretaries of state we've endured over the last few years, simply don't know the subject. They don't actually know what's true. So they believe that we need 50% more food by 2050, etc. And they believe that you need the high tech. And that's the way the world is being driven. It isn't true because, well, for one thing, the world population is leveling out and it probably won't get uh, hugely bigger than it is now. This is, this is according to the United Nations demographies. It probably won't get above 10 billion, and we're already at seven and a half billion. And also, much, much more to the point in a way, according to some of the best informed people, and I have in mind a guy I've called Hans Helen, who's uh, president, I think he's president, of the uh, Millennium Society in, in, in Washington, who's seriously well informed. And he points out that the world already produces twice as much food as we now need, and about 50% more food or 40% more food than we should ever need, because the population should never get above 10 billion. In other words, we're producing enough already for about 14 billion people. And you can work this out actually for yourself on the back of an envelope, because if you look up the figures and Google or whatever you use, <coughs> it, it says, you know, we, the world producer produces 2.5 million tons of, sorry, billion tons of grain every year, or cereals in other words, and actually two and a half ton, two and a half billion tons of cereal contains enough protein and calories to, to feed seven and a half billion people for a year. In other words, the amount of grain alone could feed us all. But grain mercifully accounts for only half of our protein and calories. And the rest comes from meat and fish and vegetables and fruit and nuts and all sorts of nice things like that. And so the whole diet provides us with about twice as much already. That's without any fancy additions to what we do already, much of which is fancy enough. So productivity is not actually the priority. And it's not what we should be focused on. We should instead be focused on quality, food quality, and on provenance. Where does the food come from and how is it produced? Excuse me. Second thing we need from agriculture is that it must be sustainable. As I'm sure everybody knows, agriculture as now practiced, for example, in Britain, is not at all sustainable. It uses far too, it, well, on the one hand, it uses far too much oil. It's, it's entirely oil dependent. And secondly, it wrecks the soil. 
And so I think it was even Michael Grove who was saying that there's a whole lot of uh, serious agricultural land in Britain, something like 30%, which has only got about 30 years more harvests left in it, which is, a, which is disgraceful. We need agriculture to, to go on for essentially forever let's say for a million years for starters. So you've got to be steadily improving the soil, not steadily running it down. Resilient almost means that, well, overlaps the idea of sustainable, but it's really different. What it really means, resilient, is that the agriculture can withstand shocks. It can withstand long periods of drought, long, recover after flood, recover after severe bad weather, etc. That's part of what resilience means. The other thing it means is that if you, if the conditions are so bad that you really can't practice agriculture anymore, or you can't practice that form of agriculture anymore, you can switch direction and practice a different form of agriculture. It's got to be flexible. And again, the kind of agriculture we have now is absolutely inflexible because there's so much capital invested in it. There's so much big machinery, etc. The farms are so big, we can't we can't change direction. And these big things, as the expression is, are considered to be too big to fail. I should at this point take a diversion and do a little history of agriculture, but that of course takes a long time, a bit too self-indulgent. But I just want to say one or two things. One is that although everybody says agriculture is only about ten or is about ten thousand years old this is probably not true at all it's probably at least 40,000 years old with the first stirrings about a hundred thousand years ago bona fide is by the time we get to the new test actually the old testament with Cain and Abel and all that kind of stuff the main problems of agriculture have already been solved because wild animals and wild plants have already been turned into domestic crops and into domestic livestock. And farmers already know how to manage these crops and livestock to a pretty good level. And the story of Cain and Abel shows we've already got arable farming on the one hand, and we've already got livestock farming on the other. And the story also shows that the two don't get on very well very often. And uh, I think it's a nice little um, aside, something to beat the vegetarians with, that God actually favoured the pastoralist. He favoured Abel, the keeper of sheep, rather than Cain, who was the chap who grew the crops. That's a, that's, that's a little detail. But my point is that agriculture is very, very ancient. And that 2,000, or oh, 3, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, the main problems had already really been cracked. We are told that by agricultural scientists and by them in high places that agriculture didn't really become serious until science became on, came on board. And that is not true. Science is, so of course, agriculture has also been highly technological, starting with digging sticks and all that stuff. And in the 17th century onwards, there were marvellous um, technologies of one kind or another, and indeed much older than that. But bona fide science, based on real understanding of how the world works, didn't come on board in agriculture until early 19th century, even the beginning, with a, with a chap called Laws in Britain and, and Liebig in Germany, and they were the first guys to work on a kind of scientifically based fertilizer, in other words, chemical fertilizer, and they started the agrochemicals industry. What I want to say, though, I mean, my own background is in science. Science is what I do. Science, I love it. But as far as agriculture is concerned, it's a Johnny come lately. And it's very, it's very important these days. It's essential. But it is the icing on the cake. Now then, when you start to look at modern farming, well, so if you look at it in the, in the round, you find that in, in today's world, there are really three levels, three different forms of agriculture. The first is what one might call artisanal agriculture, which still gets along very, very nicely without using bona fide science, experimental science at all. And this basically is the science, uh, is the agriculture of Cain and Abel, only obviously much more sophisticated nowadays. But it's agriculture conceived as craft, 
and it can be very, very high powered. And a lot of the agriculture in the world is still that, no science. Then you get to the kind of science, uh, science as a craft, but with some, agri some scientific, some science added. And when you get science as a, uh, agriculture as a craft with some science added, you get what I'm calling um, science assisted craft. And science assisted craft is essentially what most people mean by conventional agriculture, because conventional farmers, as the word is, word is usually used, um, they basically practice very traditional forms of farming, but they have things like artificial fertilizers, vaccines, drugs, etc., etc. Conventional agriculture, on the whole, done well, jolly good, is the sort of backbone. Then you come to two forms of agriculture which are really quite scientific and they're totally different. <laughs> and one is what some people are calling ag uh, conventional agriculture, but it's not. It's really high tech agriculture. And I call it neoliberal industrial agriculture. It's agriculture in which farms are conceived as factories for producing loads and loads of, well, loads and loads of stuff. And the stuff is produced for the purposes of making the maximum amount of money. All the produce, whether it's uh, crops or whether it's um, livestock, is regarded as commodities. And this is neoliberal ag agriculture. And this is the kind that our government and most big governments, certainly the American government, really favour. The other kind of sort of science-based agriculture is, <coughs> believe it or not, enlightened agriculture. What I'm talking about. But, in, but the science that you apply in the main, or almost exclusively, to enlightened agriculture is the science of ecology. Whereas the science that apply, is applied to neoliberal industrial agriculture is on the one, is basically agrochemistry with biotech thrown in, which is an elaboration of agrochemistry. And then there's all the other things like, you know, remote sensing and so on, which are fine, anybody can use those. But this is a distinction. One reason I like to emphasize it is that when I describe enlightened agriculture, which is basically sort of, it's very strongly rooted in, in, in traditional husbandry, one gets derided for, 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 for pushing science aside, for not making use of it. I'm saying we do, we do use science, but the science we use is that of, ag of, of ecology. And e ecology, although it's been a bit of a Cinderella, is really the most sophisticated of all the biological sciences. It's the one that engages most directly with Thanks. what one Thanks, Colin. Could I just say that um, you've got a few minutes to summarise, and then okay. I'd like to open up to questions. So the um, question is then, I'll come on to the what's it called, the the, the, the crunch. <clears throat> if you want to go down the agriculture agroecological route, which I'm suggesting we've got to, you finish up by saying you you, you want farms that are very that basically imitate nature. To imitate nature, you want them to be very diverse, you want minimum import, and you want, if you have minimum import, that's good, you have, and diversity, you finish up with a, a system that is very complex, and if it's complex, you have to have loads and loads of farmers. And one very serious point is that we probably need in this country about a million more farmers than we now have. We've been running them down like mad, and we've got to build them up. We need about eight times as many farmers as we have now. If you're going to have farms that are skills intensive and uh, very complex and so on, there's no real advantage in scale up. So the farm we should be looking at is small to medium sized. So we're looking at small to medium sized mixed farms with loads and loads of farmers. Now that, this is the point, is the precise opposite of what the powers that be, governments like ours, are recommending because they like monocultures, very high input on the largest possible scale, which make the most money, albeit for only a few people. Now we, Ruth and I and various other people, are at the moment setting up the College for Real Farming and Food Culture, which explores all these ideas in depth over time, we hope indefinitely, and that's what we're doing at the moment. And if anybody, anyone watching this 
would like to get involved in that, well, you're very welcome to do so. And this book, what I showed you earlier, is the sort of background text to the whole endeavour. So thank you very much for listening. I presume you were listening, but thank you very much. Really, really interesting. Thank you. And I know, I know you've got so much to say um, and, and it, it seems rude to interrupt you, but we, we, I would like to um, let people have the chance to discuss and ask specific questions, but thank you so much. Um, can, can you tell us who's publishing the book and when it will be out, Colin? Yes, it's being published by a small company in Italy called Pari, Public, Pub, Pari Publishing. Perry is a very good sort of th th think centre based in Tuscany. So it's, it's, quite, it's, it's quite nice. And, and uh, it should be, a, you know, people like Blackwells will be stocking it, people like that. And we'll yeah. be... In the next few months, the, by the end of the year? Certainly by the end of the year. I hope, I hope in a couple of months, actually. Great, great. That, that's really excellent. Okay, I'd like to open up for questions. Who would like to ask? Kevin, Kevin Middleton. Hello. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so, I mean, thank you very much for a really fascinating talk. And I, uh, I really like the, the holistic approach to it. Um, the, the question I wanted to ask you actually was about dietary change. I mean, uh, and the, the topic of being able to feed everyone. I mean, does, there are some, I, seems to me some quite good arguments made that current levels of meat and dairy consumption are probably in incompatible with a functioning biosphere long term. Do, do you think um, that a change in diet is needed or do you think that, that enlightened agriculture can feed everyone on current typical western diets or even should we do that? We can't feed everybody on a present day western diet but we can feed people on, 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 on what one might call a traditional diet. If you sort of follow the logic of agri, uh, what do you call agroecology, then you finish up focusing on arable and horticulture and you fit the animals in where they can. In other words, you've got, basically you've got chickens and pigs feeding on leftovers and you've got cattle and sheep up in the hills where it's very difficult to grow crops on the whole. So you finish up with, this is a sort of nine word summary of everything you need to know. Finish up with plenty of plants, not much meat and maximum variety because you're growing maximum diversity. Those nine words, plenty of plants, not much meat and maximum diversity, also summarize the best of nutritional theory as it's evolved over the last 60 years. Also, if you look at the world's greatest cuisines on an axis from Italy to China, where I think the best cooking is, through Turkey and Lebanon and so on, you, um, blah, blah, blah. You, um, you find that they all use meat sparingly. They use meat as a garnish. They use it for stock. And very occasionally, if their daughter's getting married or a goat has died, they have a big feast of meat but only occasionally and so the world's greatest cuisines mimic um, embrace this principle of plenty of plants not much meat and maximum variety so great cooking sound nutrition good farming go perfectly together there really shouldn't be a problem and all this stuff about you know we need ersatz meat made out of bacteria or we need to eat or we need to be vegans and all that stuff it's complete nonsense. Okay, thank you. You want to any, be a vegan, but you don't have to be. <laughs> any, any other questions? John. John yeah, Fox. yeah. Following on from what you've just been saying, then how how do we undermine the common the the, the current domination hmm. of meat production in the world? based on the fact that, I mean, the, the assumption is that because people are better off these days, as they get better off, they, they will want meat. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether they actually know that they will want meat, but 
some people and including FAO and, 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 and their uh, people uh, are suggesting that uh, we, as we have more and more people, we'll need more and more wheat, uh, more and more meat. But as we do that, we destroy more and more forest. And, and so that doesn't really work too well. No. I think this idea that as people get richer, they want more and more meat is very, very crude, based on poor nutritional theory, poor history, poor biology. Um, the thing is, when, when, if, if you look at why people eat meat, it's partly because we like it obviously and it's tasty and it's also very quick you know it's the original convenience food and uh it's also though this is very very important it's it's um, it, it's there's kudos attached to it the point is if you're very very poor you can't eat meat because you can't afford yeah. it and if you get richer you can and the real generalization about why people eat what they do is that they eat what's around and they're very, very, all of us are very, very susceptible to fashion. So if you look at the trends, I mean, you know, it is true that when the Americans started becoming affluent, seriously affluent, after World War II, meat consumption shot up like this, hamburgers and all the rest of it, and they all got very fat and, you know, whatever, you know, we'll know. Um, it's also true that this is now happening in China, for example, but how much is a sort of suppressed desire which is now let off the hook and how much is uh you know prestige and a sign of a rising affluence and of course meat is the most profitable thing to sell so once you've got people who actually can afford it there's a terrific pressure to buy it it strikes me, though, that once you get above a certain, if, if people are aware of this, and once you get above a certain level, the, the lie of this is exposed. I mean, one thing that strikes me, in, in ancient China, for example, the, 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 the people ate loads and loads of ducks, which they still do, <clears throat> but the rich people, the mandarins, only ate the skin, and they chucked away the meat, or they gave the meat to the servants. <laughs> because the skin was the tastiest bit and that I have read is how we got Bombay duck, duck which is um, duck skin wrapped in a pancake with some greens and so on and so on that's, that's one thing and the other thing if you look at the world centres now of the new wave of vegetarianism and veganism you find it's in places like California and Germany now, why is that? Because it's, it's, it's suddenly become prestigious and fashionable, and so people do it. So I suggest that if we could somehow make a proper diet, you know, traditional diet, plenty of plants, not much meat and so on, fashionable, that's, that's, that's done it, really. And that's not impossible. One thing strikes me, sorry, I don't, know, I don't want to stop you asking things, but... <coughs> is that the, the real problem apropos changing the direction of the world, I think is to wrest power away from what one might call the powers that be, away from big governments and financiers and, and corporates and return it as it were to humanity. Because it seems to me, there's a chapter about it in my book, that human beings in general are much more sensible than governments. And we really need community power, community ownership, community ownership of land, etc., local markets, etc. Lots of people have said this over the years. I'm sure it's true and I'm sure it's key. I'm also sure that um, the green agriculture should be right at the very heart of what the Green Party does, it should major on agriculture. And not only because it's, it's a, well, the whole idea of looking after the biosphere is more or less dead in the water unless we focus on agriculture, but also because it's an open goal. All the others have got it so wrong that we've only got to get it right. And I think there's an instant reason why you should be voting Green. Thank you. <coughs> Any more questions? Oh. Is, is that a question? I can just hear something. Yep. Um, Kevin. Okay, we'll have Kevin Robinson and then, oh, I've forgotten your name because the Harriet. Frank's, Harriet, because the Frank's mm -hmm. putting me off. Okay, Kevin, then Harriet. 
Right. Um, you, you did mention that uh, the particular basis of the agricultural system uh, is uh, oil, oil-based. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what, how, how do you see uh, the future uh, developing um, in terms of uh, re reducing the, the oil and you know how 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 will it end up well of course all, there's, there's all the um alternative energy type approaches which have got tremendous power i mean one one thing is i, I think for example that in a country like britain we could if we put our minds to it live very comfortably on about half the amount of energy we now use that would be a good start and of the energy that, that we really do require, all the figures I've read so that most of it really could be produced by wind and solar power and so on and so on and so on, once you get, once you get the te technologies in gear. But of course, agriculture and the food chain as a whole do, I think, use something like a third. It's an enormous amount of the, the amount of oil that's being used at the moment. And if you farm organically, which is very much a part of agroecology, then you, you don't use any of that kind, or, or you would use a bit for tractors and so on, but you wouldn't be put using the massive amounts that are now used for agriculture, for uh, uh, agrochemicals, uh, fertilizers and pesticides and so on. So there's an enormous saving there. And of course, the whole thing should be geared in the main, not exclusively, but in the main to local economies. So you should save all this frantic transport of you know potatoes being exported to Germany and then re-imported again and all that kind of stuff so you go down these routes and I think you could solve that problem I'm, I'm sure you can solve that problem and take away the emphasis on production 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 because it's not actually necessary and becomes less necessary as the as the population starts to go down again which it will thanks Colin um, Harriet. Hi. Um, actually, this question is kind of to Kate, but part of the same discussion. Um, I was really interested in Colin's point about um, changing agriculture and, and the role of the Green Party. And I just wondered if you could maybe just uh, fill us in on what the Green Party's policy is on agriculture. I mean, how do we... Uh, is transforming agriculture part of what the Green Party would like to do and how do they propose going about that? I hope that's not too hard a question, but if any of the group are aware, I'd be really interested. Mm. I'm not at the centre of things in the Green Party, I must confess. But you, you have got serious people on the case in the Green Party, including Oliver. And on the whole, the actual policy, as I understand it, the strategies are very sound. I wouldn't bother to argue with them, but it's the emphasis of the, of the party as a whole on the importance of agriculture. I think you could be, or we could be majoring agriculture instead of treating it as one thing among many. You see what I mean? Yeah, I think Mary's got a, a response to that as well, Mary. Sorry, just to say at the, the, the Green Party conference that's coming up at the beginning of October, um, there, is, um, the, 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 there is a motion to revise the current Green Party policy on agriculture. It's all been rewritten to include a lot more of this agroecology stuff. And um, with a bit of luck, um, it will be passed by conference, but it will need people to vote for it. So um, if you can have a look at the conference program and find where it's coming up, um, that would be brilliant. Mm -hmm. Get a vote in. Yeah, and, and we, uh, that's excellent. Thanks, Mary. Mary is very up to date on um, agriculture um, in the Green Party. Um, and we've also in the chat box, thanks Sue, you've put um, a link there to the Green Party policies. Um, so you can all go and do some reading afterwards. Um, and I know that something about the land ownership issue is just a huge one, Colin. And, and um, I know that 
our policy of land value tax um, would start to rebalance who owns land and 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 that for me colin is the key barrier to your excellent solution is that if you are saying that you know 90 percent of the land is you know you hear all these statistics don't you by one percent of the people in the uk um it's land ownership and we can all in you know as a small communities piddle about on common ground and allotments um, but it is really a tiny minuscule amount compared to the huge land ownership um, of, of the monopolies um, so that that barrier seems like almost insurmountable and it's something that the green party very much want to change um, the mm. land ownership um, colin do you want to just we need to finish off soon um colin do you want to kind of summarize a few points or um, not really because the yeah. whole thing is just a summary but i wouldn't mind just adding to what you've just said that mm -hmm. to one of the keys really land ownership well the whole idea of renaissance i like the whole idea of let me just go over that because that's a good point that there are three ways to change societies really and one is by reform which is step by step incremental change the second is by revolution and the third is by what i and other people perhaps are calling renaissance and reform step by step change can get us as it were so far but it can't get us where we really want to go because there is no incremental step by step state uh, f route which will take us from where we are to where we want to go and it's too slow we haven't got that long revolution is sometimes unfortunately necessary but on the whole it's too violent it's much better if you and you don't know where it's going it's too uncertain so better avoid it if you can renaissance which relates to your talk, this, um, comment on land uh, distribution kate renaissance is about um as, as i think gandhi more or less said creating the kind of world you want to see in situ as it were despite the powers that be and you create something different so that people have got something to move to and when it comes to land changes we've got the land reform broadly speaking you've got to attack it on lots of fronts but one of the fronts is community ownership and if communities get together they can own and take control of large quantities of land and put it in trust for good use in perpetuity etc so it's always this all comes back to communities as far as i'm concerned that's it Pumps. eight Oh, thank you. Um, that's excellent. Um, yeah, I think I think we do need to finish. I like I like to keep it short and sweet, and the discussion could go on and on. Um, but I think we will need to do some more thinking. Think, absorb what you've been telling us and your ideas. Um, I really, really ha am feeling quite optimistic about Renaissance. I like the idea of a Renaissance and enlightened. Um, thinking and, and community action um, and as you say reform 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 and we will just keep going as Green Party we will just put forward those reforms and hope you know as as we always do in the Green Party we put the ideas first we convince people they're right and then in a way as long as they get done we don't mind how they're done um, so it's having all these inspiring thoughts in the first place um, 